I'm going to assume today that you guys have made a class 14 directory and that you've put the research tools notes in there. There aren't too many notes this time. We're going to be doing almost everything just from typing. So we'll be creating code today to parse GPS data. And the notes mostly just have the instructions of downloading the data. Last time we spent a little bit of time trying to uh, pull the data down. So we're going to pretend that we got that all figured out and we're going to go grab some data. But first, I have some reading for you guys or listening, depending on whether you want to read or listen. It's not very long. NOAA puts out, as a part of the Ocean Service, uh, what they call podcasts. And so there's links to an MP3 audio file or the transcript. And if you click on this, you'll see there's uh, a recent set of notes that are actually pretty relevant to what we're doing. Building a better geoid. So it's the NOAA chief geodesist, Drew Smith, talking about vertical datums. And we'll see some of that. Hopefully on Thursday, we're going to plot the GPS on the roof, how well it's doing. And we'll see what is its horizontal and vertical accuracy. And give this a listen. And you'll be thinking about this as you go through working with the GPS. In here, we're just going to look at the data. We're not going to talk about the theory of how a GPS works. We'll leave that for some of your other classes. But this is just good background to have in your head as you think about GPSs. So go ahead and go down to the introduction here. And there's instructions on grabbing the data. So I'm going to copy my wget command here and pull down that data. So if you look here, there's a wget into the class directory to grab examples. And the file is, uh, so there's the file name that you'll be grabbing. And I'm going to hide class notes. So go ahead and make sure you've got that data. And this is a bzip2 file, so we need to bunzip it. Remember, you can hit tab to complete things. And it will uncompress your data. So let's take a quick peek at this data. By the end of the semester, you should be sick of seeing NEMA data. You should see it in your sleep because it's everywhere with our, with our work, unfortunately. Not always the most fun. So let's take less is our pager that we used with looking at files. So we'll just do less NEMA.log. And what we've got here is your basics. I'll go run up here and show you again the breakout. So this is CSV data, just like we've seen before, separated out by commas. But it's not quite like the other CSV data. With NEMA, it tends to start with a dollar sign. You also see some that starts with an exclamation point. There's two letters that are called the talker. So this is GP for GPS, WI for weather, um, HC for I have no idea what. Um, and then after that comes some letter codes that say the type of message. So here we've got a WMV as a weather message, HDC I think is heading, uh, GGA is your GPS, MDA is another weather message, ZDA is a time message. Uh, you should definitely, by the end of this class, know Z what ZDAs are about, what GGAs are about. The weather stuff is a little less important. And we're going to start trying to write a parser for the GGA, the GPS string. There's lots of good information in here. It's got a timestamp. It's got your latitude, your hemisphere, your longitude, a hemisphere. And oof, some of these things are like the horizontal dolution of precision and the vertical dolution of precision. The, I know the 36.1 is the elevation of the antenna up on the roof above sea level, or above the, the ellipsoid. So we've got all that information. We just want to get it out of those strings and into some place that we can plot it. Because we can't just say, please plot this. It would be nice if we could, but we can't. So we've got to write our own parser for it. But before we do that, let's get us ourselves a list of all of the NEMA messages that are in there. So this kind of goes back to some of those things that we did in that first homework assignment playing with, or I guess it's the second homework assignment, playing with things like cut. So if we do a head, NEMA.log to give ourselves some examples. If we split this on commas, and in Python it's going to be a lot easier. But we can do a cut, dash D for delimiter, and comma, and F1. Remember that in 
bash with cut, it's going to count from one, but in Python, we're always going to count from zero. So our first position here is position one. And then we can say nema.log, and we'll pipe that to head so we just get a little bit of it. And you'll see that that puts out 10 lines of these messages. Now, if we replace head with sort, and the sort command has a dash u flag for unique, which says only give us each possible re response once. So if we hit enter on that, it's going to work a little bit longer, read through the whole file, and it's going to give us all the unique lines. If you see a message popping up saying, welcome to Ubuntu 11.10, don't install 11.10. If you do an ls-l again, let's see, and go ahead and type cut space dash d comma and then space dash f1 space nm and then press tab. Now hit enter. So you see a ton of stuff. Control C. Hit the up arrow. Now add the vertical bar. Now space and then head. So there it is. Uh, type history. Just type history. So you actually put the path into your command. So you did tilde slash in your command. So you typed the whole prompt that I had there too in addition to the command. So remember to separate out the prompt from what you're typing. So if you're looking at the screen, make sure that you see these lines here where it starts from here to the beginning. This is not a part of the command. That's just saying where I'm at. If we want to find information about NEMA messages like this, we can open up Firefox and we can search for NEMA, GGA, see what comes up. And I'm going to point you guys to GPSD. There is a famous hacker called Eric Raymond, and he has put together an open documentation about NEMA strings. The documentation for NEMA is about $450 if you want to get this information. I bought a copy because I had to. I don't think you guys should have to buy a copy. So if you click on that, it will give you a, a fairly detailed description of a lot of NEMA messages, and you can do a Control F G G A, hit Control G until you get to the actual definition of of that. We won't you won't need to keep this up, but this is how I found the documentation for G G A. So it talks about how field number one is the U T C time. So there's one right here, and you'll notice that G P S's are supposed to have a very specific format. So like for example hours, minutes, seconds, and then fraction of a second. And I believe our data isn't that exact format. So if we do less NEMA.log, or we'll just do, how about grep GGA pipe head. So if we look here, they actually don't have the fraction of the second in there. So we're going to write a parser for this particular instance of GGA. If you're trying to write software for every GGA that you might run into, you're going to have to work really hard to be flexible, because every GPS violates the standard some way or other usually. So the vendors, we should beat them up for this. So we should all tell them, call them up and say you're being bad, but they may or may not change. So we're going to go ahead and work on a parser for our particular instance of it. So we're not going to worry about all the little details. Parsing. Imagine like an English sentence and you're going to break out all the pieces and figure out how it goes together. It's, it's that kind of strategy. So parsing means pulling this apart into all the pieces and turning it into something that we can use. Because the computer, and also us, this is a really annoying string. Every time you look at this, you're going to have to go look up and count how many columns over and say, this 1.1 is what? And so a parser will break that apart and tell us exactly what everything is and convert it into a useful form. Good question. All right, so let's go ahead and start creating our parser. So. We'll call it gga.py. So we'll create a Python file. And we're going to use our typical user bin env python start for a Python script. Let's go and pick a random message. So we're going to do grep gga. This is kind of a fun way to play with data. So we're going to do word count to see how many we've got. So we've got 86,000 gga's to play with. 
we'll do a head of 10,000. We're going to like go way into the middle of the data and grab a random one. Because if you look here, there's lots of zeros in our timestamp, which is going to be hard to work with. And type it to tail. So we're going to grab the first 10,000 lines with the head, and then we're going to grab the last 10 of those. So we're basically grabbing 10 GGAs in the middle of the file somewhere. And we're going to pick a random one. And if you pick a slightly different one than me, that's fine. So we'll grab one of those lines and do an edit copy. And in our GGA file, say test GGA equals, and then, and then paste with control Y that line into your Emacs window. And one thing to remember is that we want that all in one line. So here, make sure that you have your end single quote on the far right there after the string, not on the next line. Um, close. Take a look at the top up there. I've got the pound bang UN END. You're, uh, yeah. you're, you're learning lots of stuff. <laughs> and it's get, oh. It tends to bleed together as you, like if you learn multiple foreign languages at the same time, it uh, gets challenging. So yeah, so if you see the user bin env python up there. And if you guys, after you, after this class, I've done a video that's pretty close to this. Uh, I might do it slightly different here than I do in that video. You can go through that and you'll see me do all of the pieces again in the video on YouTube. So let's go ahead and start ipython. And I'm going to type, Py we don't need pylab today, but I'm going to try and make myself do it. Like in the video, sometimes you open IPython by itself, and sometimes you do IPython PyLab. Is there a difference? If I leave off the, the PyLab, it doesn't set up the plotting stuff. Oh. And I'm sorry, I'm not consistent. No, I was just wondering if there's a difference. Like yeah, if you don't need the plotting stuff, I might, I, I forget to then. Yeah. Okay. So if we do an LS in here, in our IPython, you'll see that we've got our GGA.py and our NEMA log and all this stuff. Let's remind ourselves how to use IPython a little bit. If we can uh, import modules, so we can say import GGA, and we can type dir GGA, and this gives us a directory of the things inside of the GGA module, which is our Python file. If you, if you see, that's a great one. I'll see if I can reproduce that up here real quick on the screen. So here, I haven't saved. There's two stars down here. And I'll see if I get the same thing. I don't. Uh, so if you see a pound file in here that's got the hash character or pound, that's a temporary sort of backup file that, that Emacs will generate. Uh, it'll do an autosave after some point, hopefully. Once you save this, those stars go away. Control X, Control S. And then if you do an ls-l, you'll see that there's Often there'll be a tilde file. This is another backup file. So if you completely destroy your file by accident, there's that there. There's also, if you do, after you do the import, there will also be a PYC. This is Python compiling your code. You can just ignore that file. Pretend it doesn't exist. So what you can do is you can do an import GGA, if you haven't already. And when we reload that, if you type something different in here and you type import again, nothing's going to happen. Import only does it once. It's optimized for as if you're actually running the code. And what we want to do if we have a change is say reload GGA. And that will bring in any new changes that we have into IPython. And it will look a little bit different. So it'll say reload in the module. So let's do a dir again of GGA to see what's in there. Now, most of the stuff we don't care about, these underscores, ignore those. But if you see here, there's the test GGA. So we can say gga period test.gga. So I just typed T, press tab. And if you hit enter in IPython, it's going to print out our little string. So it gives us a string to work with. And we can start trying to break that into pieces. Does anybody remember how to break a string with commas? Uh, import space gga. So if you have the file somewhere else, like your home directory, and you want to move it into your, your class 14. If you're in IPython, so if you do IPython and you're in there and you do a PWD, if we are in tilde slash class 14 and we want to get there, you can do MV tilde 
slash, say you say, saved it in the home directory, gga.py, and then you can say tilde slash class 14. And this, this right here is a space, and that's a space. So that will actually move the file over to the new place, and then you can open it inside of Emacs. So if we've got a GGA test string, does anybody remember how to break apart a CSV string? Split. Excellent, split. So we'll do our GGA test, and we can say dot split. We can ask it, how do we use it with a question mark? And we can say, so it has the SEP or separator. So we'll do separate with a comma and give that a go. So that will break it into fields for us. So give that a go, see if you can get split going. Yep, question? You didn't save that to anything, right? Or did it? Like, now is that file split? So GGA split? I'm so Bree showed us a sneak preview of this last time. Um, you I think you can actually say out and then the number that it was there, so out 14, uh -huh. and you have access to it. Uh -huh. So this, anytime there's an output in IPython, it's going to save it someplace. Yeah. So that's kind of handy if you're just playing around. Mm -hmm. We're going to go explicitly do that to sort of get ready for our own code. So what we can do is we can say fields equals mm -hmm. gga dot uh, test gga dot split. So if we do that, that'll save it to a variable explicitly. And does anybody remember the command to see all the variables in our workspace? Who yep. Now if we type who, you're going to sometimes see some behavior that you didn't expect. And I've seen this in class a couple times when I did it, and I finally figured out why it's doing that sometimes. Because if we type who normally, it should work and tell us the list of variables. What's happening is PyLab when we do the dash dash pylab, is bringing in all kinds of stuff, and it stepped on the who. So if we type percent who, you'll get the normal IPython who. And whose is the other one that lists out variables. And there's these things called magic functions inside of IPython, which is like the ls command. They have all these fancy aliases to hide things for you to make it easier. So you can always get the magic commands are actually a percent and then some command. And they have these aliases that make them just be without the percent. So you can always get at them with the percent. And so who got clobbered by PyLab. So you can say percent who. So saying whose is the same as percent whose. One of those things that's a little surprising, it got me, it had me confused for a couple classes and I finally figured it out. We now have fields. So you can just type fields and you'll see your list. And we can now access them by number. So we could say fields. I mean, it's a, just a, a list, and we can access the first one as 0, and the second one is 1. No, that's OK. Um, one, you used a period instead of a comma. So you you got to be very careful. When you code and you program, you have to be very careful with punctuation and precision. So that looks better. And if you actually want to use the fields, you have to say fields equals and that. So you're going to do, so I'm going to hit Control R to search back. Say fields. Hit Control R a couple more times until I get it. And that command 24 is the command that I ran to set the fields variable right there. So what you do, take a look up there. I'll hit Control R. This is the search back through your history. So control R, and it says reverse search. And then you can just start typing some part of what you had, so maybe GGA. And it's now going to be matching into your history things that are GGA. And you can keep hitting control R, and it will go back through previous commands. And you can hit control C to get out of that if you don't want what's there. So if we have field, minus 1 goes from the back end of the this, this fields. So if we do fields. Minus 1 right up here took us to the very last one. So minus counts from the, the right hand side. So let's go ahead and take our field command that we had here. We're going to copy this and we'll go into our Emacs and we're going to paste that in there. And we're going to start building up 
our function that we're going to do over time here. So we actually want to create a function. So def gga line. And so we talked about functions last time. This is going to create a new function called gga. And maybe we'll make it a little bit different. We'll say decode gga. And then you have to indent to start your function. So what I did is I pressed enter right after the colon there. And it will automatically indent for you. And we're going to change this around here and make this, instead of being our test message, we can say line. So we have line coming in as our argument that basically someone's going to pass in some line of text. And we're going to say line.split on the comma, assign that to fields, so we can start building up our parser. So let's go ahead and start trying to parse part of this. We're going to start off. Yep. Is it doing the same thing by just having line.split versus the gga.test? Yeah, so in here, the gga test thingy that we've got here is a helper just to have a sample around so we don't have to type it. And in here, this is a local variable that we're working on. Here, we're going into this import module and we're grabbing the test message so we could play with it a little bit. You're going to watch the, I'm going to sort of go back and forth a bunch with that a few different ways. So let's go ahead and play a little bit more on the IPython side. So we've got our fields, and fields, um, what number would the time one be up here? What index would that be at? Anyone know? One, one? yes. So fields of one looks something like that. So it's a series of six digits. And that's going to be our hours, minutes, and seconds. So I'll just tell you the formats as we go through them rather than going into that document in, in uh, Firefox. So the time section is going to be two digits for the hour, two digits for the minute, and two digits for the second. So we need to break it into these pieces and turn each of them into an integer. So we want an integer from that one, and that's going to give us some number. You having trouble with the fields? Yeah. You can just retype. There's the command right there to type again. So that's. The dummy yeah, you can rename these things anything you want. If you want to call it fields with a capital F, you could do that. Yeah, you have to be really careful. It's. I think you probably. Oh, you used a period. You yeah, a you split on a period. You have to split yeah. on a comma. They're, CSV they're comma. is comma separated. So that character is the comma, not a period. So let's go ahead and say time string equals fields one. So we've got a variable that we can remember. A lot of times with programming, a key thing is not necessarily about how few lines of code can you write, but how clear can your code be. And if you read it later on, can you figure out what you were meaning? And things like numbered fields really suck. Because I look at the GGA message, and I think that's field 9, but I'd have to count every single time. And during my PhD, I lost it when I had a table with, like, I was doing, like, column 26 minus column 25. And my head exploded. It was bad. So I like named fields. I like to be able to refer to them by what they are in English. So if we say, whose, you'll now see the time string is just like that. So what we want to do is split this into those three pieces and turn them into numbers. So the first thing we do is create a variable called hour. So if we say hour equals time string. And does anybody remember how to grab the first two characters off a string? If it's like a list, Zero comma one, that's close. Colon one. Yep. So square brackets are your uh, array addressers or list addressers. And a colon, so it goes from beginning range to ending range here. So if we leave off the left hand side, it'll start from the beginning. Now remember that when you do these lists of strings, it's going to go up to but not including the number. So if we've got 
Uh, so up here we've got 0, 2, 4, 6. So 0, 2, 4, 6, and then 3, 4. If we say colon 2, this is at position 1. Or sorry, this is at position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So colon 2 says we're going to go from the beginning up to but not including, so it's going to stop right here, 2. So it's going to get 0 and 1. And I think this is one of those things where you just got to do a whole bunch of them until you start getting used to it. And if you go and use other programming languages that don't count from 0, life gets kind of confusing. MATLAB might not count from 0. So go ahead and try that, and then just say hour, and hopefully you see 0, 2. Does anybody see what's wrong with our 0, 2? There's something that we don't really want in that. Is it, yep, there's an extra 0 there, and do you notice what's around the 0, 2? The two little single quotes? That's a string, so if we say type hour, we get back a string. And Typically with things like hours that are numbers, we don't want a string of it, we want the actual number. So you could do some math with the time. And we can always convert a string by just saying int, or if we wanted to float, you could say float. So then you get back the number two. So what we really want, rather than what we have in 31 here, this turned it into a string. We'd rather go back up to that and we want to say, take that whole string we got back and turn it into an integer. So we cross our fingers and we hit enter. And now if you type hour, you get back just the number two. If we say type hour, it tells us that it's an int. Why did we want to get rid of the zero? The zero is part of a string. So if you want to be able to do any sort of math with the time, a string is not very helpful, because if you start doing math on a string, it's going to compare character numbers, and we really don't want that. So let's go ahead and try to put this into our function over here on the left. So I'm going to copy this part. So here's where I'm going to use that history command to go back and see what I was doing. So history. And we can. the thing that you'll do with IPython a lot of times is it's a place to just try and play and try to find how to do it in Python as you read up on the documentation of how to do things. So right here, the time string equals fields, that's when we grabbed that out of the fields because we had these uh, nine or ten different things. So we can copy that one and we can paste it in here. So what we've done is we take this long string here, we're going to pass it into our function in line we're going to break it into those pieces with the split like we did before. We'll save that into a variable called fields. Then we're going to go and work with fields bit by bit. We're going to take each of those sections and we're going to figure out how to deal with each one of them. And so we'll say time string equals and we'll grab field one. You could always just work with this, but if you come back in a couple months and try to read this and you're going to be dealing with fields one, two, three, it's going to get confusing. And you'll actually see I do that in the videos and it actually makes it a lot harder to follow the code. So now we'll take field one here coming out was, so field one, so this is field zero, one. This section is our little bit of time. So that'll be in this time string variable. And we can then take the hour out of that by grabbing the first two characters and turning it into a number. Is it like taking up extra memory or anything by making the time string equal fields? Like if you had a lot of those. Yeah, when we're working here, don't worry about speed or memory. Yeah. The goal here, when you're writing code, it's an unfortunate phrase called premature optimization. If you try too hard to make things clever and fancy first, yeah, it's very important. If you try too hard to make things fancy at first, all you're doing is you're hurting yourself time-wise. The, the goal is the expensive part of a computing system is you. You cost way more than the computer. If the computer has to work an extra second, that's, that's the computer's problem. Every moment that you sit there, you cost yourself or your boss or your company or whatever the time to be there. And if a computer has to work a lot harder because we wanted to work quick, to get things going and it was easier for us, mm -hmm. then that's, that's the computer's problem. You know, if it's gonna work hard, we don't care. 
So in this case, we're going to do everything we can to abuse the computer and make our lives easier. We can, if you see some of the code that I write for production stuff, after I've figured out how to do something, I'll come back and write code. There's times I can barely read what I'm doing because I'm doing every fancy trick in the book because I'm processing terabytes of data as fast as I can to try and keep up with something. Here, it's more about can we write clear code, can we follow what we've done, and can you read it in six months? And if you ever think that you write code and that you'll just get it when you come back, try putting code away for a year or two and come back and really try and debug it. It's, it's almost like someone mm -hmm. else wrote it most of the time. Even if you did a good job, you have to treat the code as if you're uh, it's written by someone else and you're trying to understand it. So let's go ahead and make a print statement to see this. So we'll say print hour. We're not going to worry about trying to return the data back or anything like that yet. And you know what? We'll make it even better. We'll put print and we'll make a, a little string hour colon in quotes followed by our hour. So hopefully if this works right, we're going to see hour colon printed out and then a number right after it. So I'm going to go ahead and try to run this function and hopefully we get it to go. So this is taking all the pieces that we've had up till now in all of our lectures and trying to glue them together into actually doing something. So we'll say reload GGA. If you have a syntax error, this is where it will show up in here as a, some sort of problem. And we can now run our function. So GGA period decode GGA. And you're now going to pass in some line of text. Now you could type in a NEMA string in here, but we've made our lives easier by sticking a test one around we can use. So we can say in here, we'll say uh, GGA dot and then test and then tab. So we're going to grab that string that we have saved as our test message. We're going to pass that in. Does that make sense? Once you get it, it should be fairly obvious, I hope. Do you have to have those spaces before and after? I'm just trying to be really obnoxious with my spaces to make it easier to see. Okay. Uh, you don't, the spaces aren't required in this, this language. In Bash, we have all kinds of space issues. The only spaces in Python that really matter a ton are the indentations. If you're brave, hit enter, and hopefully you see our colon two. Anyone see our colon two? Yeah. Yay. All right. So let's go ahead and try to parse the, so we've done the hour. Let's do the minutes and the second. So did you reload? And yeah. I'm going to keep saying this, guys, until you're sick of hearing me say it. When you, with Emacs, always take a look to see if you've saved. If you see two stars in that bar at the bottom of your file, it means you haven't saved. And no matter how much you type, if you haven't saved, it's not going to appear in your, in your run. The process is typically you write code, make sure you save, so no stars, and then you reload your module, and then you can run your, try out your function. When you ran the, um, or when you did that last command, mm -hmm. you have to pass the GGA dot test underscore GGA like to the dot py file if it's already here like we already defined ah it. that's a great question so inside this function we're trying to make this function be generic so it's for any string this function doesn't know anything about that string if you notice there's no test underscore GGA anywhere in here so it it it's taking in something called line it doesn't know what that is until you call it so here we're going to call the decode GGA function we have to pass it in the test DGA so that it knows what it's decoding and we can grab that from the module itself. So we're, we're taking it back out of this file and then we're calling the function and passing it back in that same data. Does that? You call that function without acknowledging the fact that you can find test DGA in the file? Yeah, so yeah. the fact that in here since there is no test GGA inside of that function, it doesn't actually know anything really about that. You could, it might be a little bit simpler to see it like this. We could say decode GGA test GGA. And if we save that, we can then say run 
FGGA. And in here, what this will do is it'll start up, load this file, and it's going to work from top to bottom. It'll say test GGA, load this data block. So it's save that string in this variable. It's going to then define a function, load that up, and then it's going to call decode GGA with that parameter in it. We could also just pass it in. We could also just take this guy right here and call it like that. Does that help out a little bit, seeing it a couple different ways? We're, we're doing the same thing like four different ways there. And the thing about this is that we're using this file as sort of a wrapper to keep things contained together. And we have test data inside the file that we can use. So typically, when you'd use this later on, you'll be loading data out of a file or pulling it from the network someplace. And it won't have test DGA. You'll be just grabbing it out of someplace and then stuffing into that function and saying, please pull this apart and return to me the X and the Y that we want for that. How can I avoid to print the new character after the button? If you have a trailing comma. It's kind of weird. So let's go ahead and start decoding all of the different parts. Let's go back to IPython here and we have the time string. And let's go ahead and parse out the minutes and the seconds. So we'll say minute equals, and then we need to take our time string. And what numbers do you guys think are going to be for pulling out the minutes in there? Two and three is close. Two and four is, oh, that's right. you wanted two and three, so then you specify two colon four because you remember the second one, second number we don't go, we go up to but not including that number. So two colon four and print minute. And one thing, so I showed you guys that out command before here. Notice there's no out if you type print. And if we just type minute, there's the out, so then you can refer to that out 45. So let's go ahead and copy this guy. Just so you know, a lot of professional programmers code exactly like this. They work with IPython, they try things out, and then they paste it into their code as they go. It's totally okay way to, to, to write code. You might see people sometimes will write tons and tons of stuff and then they try to run it later on. They also sometimes, the same people have a lot of problems trying to get that huge blob of code to all work right. We're gonna make that integrate, right? Ah, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Like this? Uh, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> good catch. So if we try that again, we'll go up here and just double check that that works. Int. So if we type minute and then type minute to make sure it is an integer. Excellent. And now we need to do the same for seconds. So oftentimes I'll write things short, but if you abbreviate minute min, which a lot of people do, that's the same as the function min or minimum of some list. Uh, so I recommend not using min as a short for a minute. Although it's often nice to be able to type less, that's, that's a dangerous one. So we'll say seconds, and I'm just going to abbreviate SEC. We'll do the int again, and time string. And who wants to shut out some numbers to put in here? Four colon. Four colon, excellent. So that was start from position four and go to the end. We could have also said four colon six. So if we do that, print sec, that looks pretty good. But uh, if the second can be also decimal, then it's better to use the noise. Yes, if you want to be more generic, here we're just trying to write one just for the specific case. If you try to write an actual parser for all GGAs, it's going to be about 10 times as much code as we'll have today, because you'll have to check all sorts of craziness. Which is why it's often good to use a library that someone else has taken a lot of time and written tests for. And so we'll do copy, and we'll paste that in. So now let's create a print statement that says all of our different things. So minutes, minute, and I'll get rid of my S and stay consistent. Second. So if we do that, that should hopefully print out our hours, minutes, seconds. So we should see two for our hour. 46 for our minutes, and 34 for our seconds. 
So let's go ahead and type run GGA. Now notice I'm not doing a reload right now because we've added this decode inside of here. So if we reload that, it's always going to do the same thing. It gets a little confusing when you have actual running code in a module that you try to import. If you don't have that in there. We can comment that out and we could do it like we were before. So you can say comment reload. and then reload. Okay. It doesn't have the weird like run it as it's going and then we can do GGA dot decode. We can go back to that test. Yes? Of course. Right, I'm trying to accept that my minute, I, for some reason it didn't become an integer. Do I have to re, like, reload it to get it to, it's saved. So do a reload? Minute? Oh, so you're just playing around with it. So here in 38 you did minute equals time string. Uh -huh. um, so you basically need to scroll up to that same command and add the int to it here. Oh, because okay. those so two things are separate from each other. Right. What happens so in a function? I save it here, it doesn't yeah, well. so when you're working with local variables, so this is a key thing. These variables in here are local to this function. They don't exist anywhere else but inside of there. So when you have a variable over here, like seconds equals, this SEC and this SEC have nothing to do with each other. They live in different worlds. Yeah, if you had multiple lines of the GGA string and running this, it keeps outputting the next the string. So something like, if we delete that, and let's go grab some other GGAs back here. I ran into a problem where I thought I was reading the first header and then I kept, I guess I was reading subsequent lines. So something like decode GGA, like that? Yeah. So here you'll see the first one should have 34 and the next one should have 38. Yeah. So if we say run that, they'll come out with seconds 34 and the next time through seconds 38. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I've, I didn't ask the question, but I'll ask later. All right, so now let's go ahead and we're going to do something a little more exciting than the time because time's interesting but not we really want to know where we are. So we want to take this part of a GGA string and we want to turn those characters into our latitude and longitude. And this is where I kind of don't like NEMA and I'm kind of annoyed by it a lot. Maybe kind is the wrong word. So they've got 43 and then 08 period. One, two, six, eight, one, two, six, eight, and then that's north with a comma. That is your latitude. That's not a latitude that anybody really wants. What all is here? This part is your, uh, your degrees, so it's 43 degrees north, and then this part right here is decimal minutes. Whoever did that. They could have just given us decimal degrees and we could have just loaded up and been done, but they want you all to have to work for the rest of your life a little bit harder every time you write a partial for this stuff. Thanks guys, good job. You're gonna find stuff like this all throughout the standards and somebody had a really great reason they convinced everybody else on the committee who did this that this was a great idea. And it's not a great idea, but this gives us extra practice in writing little parsers. So when, when I say parser, we want decimal degrees out of this. That's uh, writing a parser is taking this weirdness and returning the right number that's just a decimal degrees floating point number so that we can just plot it on a map because that's really what we want to do. So we're gonna go ahead and try and do that. So what I typically do in functions, this is a great time for a blank line. Yes. So I see how I have the decode GGA lines at the bottom down there? Yeah. I have like two lines down here. Okay. You don't that. have something like that. Okay. So when you run it, it's going to save that variable, right. create this function, and then do nothing. Okay, so I have to type it. Yeah, decode. so you'd have to do a decode GGA at the bottom. Okay. All right, so let's try and break that apart. So we're gonna go back here and type fields to remember what we had in our fields. And so field zero, was our little GGA header part. Field one was our time. Field two is 
everything except for the end for north. So we'll say lat string equals fields and two. So hopefully that should capture that for us. So we'll type lat string. Are you doing the underscore str just for your, I mean, you could have just done lat equals, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a style thing. You don't have, you do or you can do it. You don't have to do it. Okay. In here I'm doing it because if I just wrote lat, you might think that that's a decimal degrees latitude. And by putting an underscore str on it, it's like beating you over the head that this is a string and it's not what your end result is going to be. Um, sometimes you do this just to be like obnoxiously obvious what you're doing in your code. You'll find in some code it'll drive you nuts when people do that. It's just too wordy and it gets in the way. I'm hoping here it helps you guys out to kind of remember that that's a string. I typically wouldn't do that in my code. I would hope that in the context you'd see it's a string. My function isn't very long, so you could remember it. But if, if your code starts getting multiple pages, you'll have to do stuff like this. But you should also realize if your code, or if a function is multiple pages, you probably did something wrong because anything that's longer than a page is hard to follow. You know, it's like trying to read a story where you've got to remember all the pieces. And you got to keep jumping back to look in the front part, and it's going to get confusing. Can you just make multiple modules and then just run them separately. Yeah, you'll see you'll see bits like the checksum part here. There's this little weird thing on the end that you have to calculate some number based on all this text. I write that as a separate function, and I stick it someplace else, and you'll see like calculate checksum. So let's go ahead and get ready for this. So we'll just say latitude is a comment. And this just gives you a hint that this whole section is going to be about latitude. And then we'll copy in our little lat string to get ourselves set up here. So let's go and try and break this apart and turn it into what we need to get our y value. So if we say lat string, which parts are, are we going to put in here to get the two degree parts out, the 43? What do we want in the square brackets? Yep, I hear several correct answers. You could do 0 colon 2 is one way, or you could leave that 0 out. So we hit enter. You get back the 43. We wanted to get an integer from this, right? So you guys remember we can do int. So that gets us the first part, our degrees. So we pull off the degree part. Now we want to deal with this decimal minutes. That's when we say, thanks, guys, for making our lives extra difficult. So lat string. Now, how do we get the rest of it? If we've peeled off the first two, before we want to peel off the back half? Two colon. Two colon, right on. So there's the back half. Now if we call int on that, it gets very unhappy with us because there's a decimal in there. So that zero, eight point stuff, when you call int, it just says, I'm sorry, I don't really allow decimal places in integers, so piss off. So what we want to do is we want to call float. So there's our nice little float. But they've made our lives difficult. So they're trying to cause it to have bugs in our code. If we add that number, 8.1268 to the 43, we do not have our answer. Because that's minutes. That's not decimal degrees, which we would like. Does anybody know how to convert from minutes to degrees in latitude? Divide by, 60. yep. So we want to divide that by 60. So that gives us our decimal part of the degrees. So now we've got all of our pieces together. We've got to go find them all and glue them together. What's the theory behind the 60 degrees? This is, you actually didn't need it. I just do this out of like habit. What happens is if you, if you take two integers and divide them, you end up with a weird rounding problem. Out of habit, I type a period to make this a floating point number two to guarantee I didn't need to because I've already said this is a float, so we're okay. But if you try to take two integers, and I'll show you a quick example. If we said 59 divided by 60, and we get zero, which is not what we want to get. So if we do period, then we get a floating point number. I do a lot of sort of defensive coding things where I'm trying to protect myself to make sure I don't make a stupid mistake because I've made so many stupid mistakes in my life coding that I have a few fewer would make my life a lot better.
So let's go grab our pieces. We can just do a history again. And let's go find our front part, which was 61 for me. So we'll do edit, copy, and edit, paste. And we're going to add to it the second part, the decimal portion, paste. So hopefully, press enter, and we get our decimal set up. And what we're going to want to do is say y equals, and now we have it saved. So we're going to copy that and paste this craziness right there. So unfortunately, we couldn't just say something like that where we just did uh, int or a float and then some string and just turn it right into the number we want. We have to do some fancy cutting apart and re-gluing together all the pieces. The GGA message is a great way to learn how to deal with strings and pull things apart. But in terms of a designed message, I give it a, a pretty poor grade. What if that next field, so if we've got our fields here, we just use this one, which was number two. This part right here, n for north, if we had an s, what would we need to do to our y value? If your latitude is in the southern hemisphere, how do you represent that as a decimal degree number? Negative. Negative. Yeah, so we need to say y equals, and we, we won't do it on this one, but for the west, east-west on the longitude, we'll do it for sure. So what we would say is if fields, so what number was that? Three? Zero, one, two, three. It's the end of three. Equals s y equals negative y. Or you can say times minus one or however you like to write. Flip the sign. So let's go ahead and I'm going to get rid of this guy. And let's try it out. So we'll say print latitude y. So I'm going to go ahead and use the run command again. So r run. Now we've got our nice decimal latitude that we can actually use in code to do things with. On Thursday, we've got 10 more minutes here. We're going to try and do longitude really quick. On Thursday, I'm going to pre-build an array that we can load up of latitude, longitude, everything that's in the GGA. And we're going to go use matplotlib, and we're going to plot up this GPS in all of the different parameters. We're going to watch how good that GPS on the roof is and see if it's any good and how much we can trust the thing. So now we're going to do the, the longitude. So this is latitude. Let me get rid of this guy here. It's going to be very similar, but not quite exactly the same. So we're going to have 0, 7, 0, 5, 6, a period, your favorite full stop, 3761, comma, and then the W. So before we had two digits, now we're going to have three digits here. And then this is going to be, so this is our degrees, and this is our decimal minutes. So we're going to do almost the exact same thing, but we're going to have to change our 2 to 3 to slide that a little bit around. And so in my code here, I'm going to try and scoot this up so we can keep it up high for the people in the back. I'm going to put another comment after a blank line and say longitude just to give ourselves some visual space between latitude and longitude, we'll say long string fields, and we're going to have to go count again. Here's where I'm going to do a split, so control X, two, and this is when things get long, they tend to be no fun. Oh wait, it's right next to us, never mind. So we can basically say, this is zero, one, two, three, four. So we'll go try it over here and say fields four. Yep, okay, good. So that's gonna get us the long string, just like we had before with, so we're gonna do very much like what we did in here, but change it around for our longitude. So we'll say x equals int l-o-n as opposed to l-a-t, s-t-r, and Instead of grabbing the first two characters, we're going to grab the first three characters. So three. So that's going to get us the 0, 7, 0, the degrees portion. We're going to add to that the decimal minutes part. So we'll say float 
an LON string. And again, we got to start from the third character, go to the end, and divide by 60. I'm going to put the period again just out of habit. Let's go ahead and say print longitude x colon comma and then x. So let's try running that. Do we get it or do we miss it? Do we miss something? Yeah, we missed the sign. We're in the western hemisphere, which is to the left and is negative. So we have to check for that w here, just like we checked up here. So we'll say if fields 5, so 1 past our 4 where we just were, equals west, x equals negative x. Flip the sign there. Now if we run it, we get minus 70.9. And hopefully, if you put this in a mapping program, it'll have a point right on the roof of this building. And if not, we have a bug. But I checked and it's on this building. So that's the basics of parsing data. So when you've got a format, there's almost always something annoying getting in your way. People do funny things. And parsing is all about undoing all those oddities that you don't want and turning it into simple data that you can work with. If we parse a whole file full of these GGAs, we can then get that position of the GPS over time, and we can then see the wander of the GPS stability on the roof, which isn't perfect, but hopefully it's pretty good. I haven't done the numbers yet to see how good our GPS is, but by the end of Thursday, we'll make a plot that actually tells you in the number of meters how far that GPS drifts during a day. So then when you go out and you take a position with a GPS and you hit the button and you write down the numbers, you'll have a sense of what a GPS can do with one measurement and how far off it might be. Each GPS will be a slightly different value, how much its error might be, but at least we'll know that one and we have a sense of what, what can be. So definitely watch videos 11, 12, and thir or 11 through 14. 14 is going up today. It's currently trying to, in my office, trying to remove a really hideous noise that it recorded with my voice. I can't make any more videos in this building. For some reason, there's a weird electrical noise or something. Watch those videos. You'll see very much the same thing. The video notes have detailed examples going through all of this stuff, all the way up through and including the GPS wander plot. And on Thursday, we'll load up the data and we'll learn how to make some nice figures in matplotlib, put titles on things. And the nice part about that is the data will be ready to go. And you, if you don't understand this part, you can put off getting that figured out till later on, until uh, maybe you have some data that you actually need to parse. And we can dig right into the plotting. So we'll just load up a file and get going with data that's already been corrected to be nice without things like decimal minutes in the data, which is no fun.